So the, the talk for my, or the, the title for my talk today is um, Model Informed COVID-19 Vaccine Prioritization. And specifically, my group has been looking at age and serostatus. So just to give a little bit of context, um, my group really started thinking about this kind of back in summer of 2020. Um, and so kind of a lot of these ideas are commonplace now and, and have already been discussed in the workshop today. Um, but I just kind of wanted to, to set the stage for how we approached this question of vaccine prioritization um, and kind of the, the point of view that we were thinking about this problem. Um, and so as, as other people have kind of discussed, there's really kind of two main approaches to think about vaccine prioritization. Um, the first is maybe the most obvious. Um, and so that is to directly protect the most vulnerable by prioritizing them for vaccination. And then on the other hand, you could go with kind of this indirect protection approach, um, which is to instead prioritize those who have the most contacts and therefore kind of the most potential for spread. And so this is really like a herd immunity approach um, and a really key assumption if, if this is the strategy you're gonna go with is that the vaccine blocks at least some level of infection um, and or transmission. And so kind of thinking about these two different ideas, um, it kind of seems like they're gonna point us in two different directions for who to prioritize. And so the motivation um, that my group was really thinking about here is, are there general principles um, for when to use a direct versus an indirect protection approach? And so we really wanted to get at, when is one better than the other? And kind of can we, um, know this ahead of time without having to run a bunch of model results. So getting into the specifics a little bit, like I said, we started this project kind of back in summer 2020. So before we knew anything about um, vaccine efficacy or what um, distribution was gonna look like. And so when we were developing this model, really we were focused on um, how you should prioritize initial doses, so when the supply is limited. And we are only looking at within a country, um, whereas kind of the talk right before this was, was more looking at global allocation, we were just looking at prioritization within one area. Um, and it was really important when we started this project to think about kind of what relevant parameters there are, um, what do we know about them, and Obviously, we've learned a lot over the past year, um, but there are still many kind of questions about vaccine efficacy, um, the speed of rollout, that kind of thing. And so we really wanted to be able to incorporate those in our model um, to see if that changed kind of the general principles of when the direct versus indirect approach is better. And so I wanna spend a bit of time kind of talking about our model um, to show what we included and, and what it's capable of and kind of how it, how it worked. Um, so similar to other groups that have presented today, uh, we used an age structured SEIR model and we were looking at three different outcomes. Um, so cumulative incidence, mortality and years of life lost. There are different measures you could also choose to look at, but that, that's all we're gonna be focused on today. And so we included um, age varying susceptibility, the infection fatality rate um, varying by age. And so th these are really important to be able to capture within your model um, to get the disease dynamics correct. We also um, included country specific contact matrices and age demographics. Uh, so an example of that is shown here on the right hand side. Um, and as you might expect, obviously kind of uh, the, the structure of a population varies widely um, between countries. And so we, we wanted to be able to include this um, to know kind of how does this affect our, our big picture takeaways? Um, and are we going to be able to say kind of on a broad level when a direct versus indirect approach is better or, or are these results going to really be kind of country dependent? Um, so we weren't sure when we started this project what the result was gonna be there.
So briefly, just kind of hitting on some other um, aspects that our model included. We wanted the ability to change rollout speed, um, as well as the total amount of vaccines available. And we included just a baseline rate of 30% vaccine hesitancy. Um, but this is certainly kind of quite up in the air and can, can change country to country. Um, so that's another place where we could given some, some more data on this information, um, go back and see how, how that affects results. Thinking about the vaccine properties specifically, um, the values that we needed to be able to include vaccination in our model was the overall efficacy. Um, we also looked at possible decreases in efficacy by age. So we really weren't sure if this was gonna be um, a problem when, when we started this project. And so we wanted to see if this kind of should shift our ideas about prioritization. And then we also looked, uh, considered three different models for efficacy. Um, and so if, if you've worked with vaccine models before, um, probably these incorporating efficacy might seem um, straightforward, but I just wanted to touch on this for a moment um, because a priori, like we really weren't sure what vaccination was going to look like. And I think it's a really important part that um, we should know if a modeling choice is affecting our results or not. So the way that we include efficacy in the model um, may or may not kind of change our results. And so the three different models for vaccine efficacy that we used um, are described here. So consider a vaccine that has 90% um, efficacy. One way that this um, could be interpreted is that the vaccine fully protects nine out of 10 people. And so one out of 10 gets no protection at all. Kind of alternatively, um, we could think instead about a vaccine that protects 90% um, from infection and, and that is to everybody who is vaccinated. And then the third model, which we've come to realize um, kind of over the course of, of the last year um, that this really is kind of most realistic for the mRNA vaccines um, that we have is incorporating um, this vaccine efficacy as reducing clinical disease by 90%. And then the effects on infection and transmission um, can vary. And so there are names for these, for these different types of models. Um, the first is an all or nothing vaccine. The second is a leaky vaccine. And then the third is a variable transmission blocking vaccine. Um, and so, like I said, we, we weren't sure at the beginning kind of which would be the most realistic. And I do think um, it's important to know when this modeling choice is going to affect our results. And so we implemented all three um, to see if it, if it changed how we should be thinking about prioritization. And then the prioritization strategies that we chose um, was really just to look at kind of these five straightforward options. And so we did this based off of who the vaccine may be approved for, and then kind of logistically what is most feasible. Um, and so you can see those five options here on the right, looking at under 20, adults 20 to 49, um, all adults 20 plus, or, or strictly older adults. Um, and then the last option, so all ages, is really um, no prioritization by age, so it's just uniformly at random. Okay, um, getting into the results a little bit. I, I just want to emphasize that this slide here is showing kind of a very specific um, scenario, and our model allows us to run um, different scenarios. So you could specify either the country you're looking at, the type of vaccine efficacy, the value or the amount of ongoing transmission. Um, and so this is really just to give you kind of a taste of what our, our model results look like. So here um, we can see if we, if we run our model forward in time, um, we can look at the performance of each of these kind of five vaccine strategies. And on the top row, um, we're looking at the percent infected over time. And on the bottom is cumulative mortality. Um, and the difference between the columns is just two different values for vaccine supply. But really, since we kind of want to understand um, these, these bigger picture takeaways, um, we wanted a way to summarize these results. 
And so we took um, just the total amount of people infected and the total amount of people who died in the simulation and plotted those um, as a function of vaccine supply. So that's what we're looking at here in kind of these summary plots on the right hand side. On the top, you can see um, the percent reduction in infections in, for each of these priori priori uh, sorry, <laughs> um, prioritization strategies um, compared to when no vaccine is available. And really at all levels of vaccine supply in this case, we see that prioritizing those who are 20 to 49 reduces infections the most. Um, if instead, though, the, the goal of um, vaccination is to minimize mortality, we see that on the on the bottom plot um, that prioritizing adults 60 plus is the best way to go about that um, for this specific scenario. And so that's really the direct protection approach that I was talking about earlier. So like I said, this is one kind of very specific um, scenario just to give you a sense of kind of what these model results are looking like. So if we consider changing one of these parameters, um, say you're in a region where transmission is highly mitigated and so um, the reproductive number is much lower and, and kind of close to one, then we see that um, we get the same result on, on the top row. So here looking at um, if the goal of vaccination is to kind of minimize um, the total number of infections, then the best way to do that in this case is to prioritize adults 20 to 49. Um, and we actually see that it's also the best option um, to minimize mortality in this case. And so once again, really what we're trying to understand is, is when um, direct protection versus indirect protection is, is the best way to minimize mortality. Um, and specifically, we want to know kind of how sensitive our results are to these different parameters. So to be able to kind of dig into this sensitivity analysis, um, we're going to take those summary plots that I just showed on the previous slide um, and represent those in a heat map. So here on the right, um, the color now indicates what the minimi mortality minimizing strategy is. Um, and so for the fixed value of R0, we are seeing um, that prioritizing oldest adults was the best way to go for all um, values of vaccine supply considered here. And so that is why the, the row is um, purple across all values of vaccine supply. And so then that's where we can ask kind of how sensitive is this result um, to the reproductive number. And you can see that when R0 is low um, and close to one, then that indirect approach is, um, is the best option. So prioritizing 20 to 49. But um, if there is kind of higher levels of, of ongoing transmission, then direct um, protection is, is really the way to go. Okay, so this framework and kind of looking at all of these heat maps um, allows us to ask questions to try to get at uh, kind of these, these general principles. And so one question we might consider is, um, does the, Prioritization depend on timing and speed of distribution. And what about R0? So here, um, the middle heat map is the exact same one that we were looking at beforehand. And now on the left-hand side, we can see what if um, the speed of rollout is half as fast. And on the right-hand side, we can see um, Kind of the other extreme option of what if you have the ability to roll out your vaccine um, really pre-transmission. So this might be the case, say, if um, you're in a country that, that had the ability to um, lock down heavily and, and did a really kind of successful job at mitigating transmission thus far, um, and kind of what options do you have for vaccine prioritization now? So we can see between the, the left-hand side and the middle heat maps, um, there's really kind of uh, no differences. 
Um, and so it's that same takeaway that if if R is high higher um, and not close to one, then prioritizing adults 60 plus is the way to go. Um, kind of alternatively, on, on the far right hand side, um, if you're in this scenario where you have the ability to roll out vaccines kind of prior um, to transmission, you just have more options. Um, and an indirect approach actually may be kind of the best option in that case. Another question we are really interested in is how do these results depend on the population structure? Um, so here, the rows in the heat map are just kind of a random subset of countries around the world to, to try to get some sort of sense of, of how these um, dynamics vary. On the left hand side and in the middle, um, we are considering when, when R0 is low. So in, once again, in those kind of well mitigated um, scenarios. And in that case, we really do see um, dependence on, on the country that you're in for whether or not you should go with that direct or indirect approach to minimize mortality. But um, if we're in this regime where R is higher here on the right hand side, we can see that there really is a robust uh, choice to go with um, prioritizing adult 60 plus. So now um, all the previous results that I was kind of just talking about were for the all or nothing vaccine model. Um, and the results were very similar for the leaky model as well. So that was kind of nice to um, reinforce. And kind of now we're gonna dig into that, that third um, model for vaccine efficacy. And so um, asking what if the vaccine only partially blocks transmission? Um, this kind of question will be very important considering kind of the data that we're seeing for, for the mRNA vaccines, um, and especially as, as the new variants arise. Um, and so here, I, I know there's a lot of heat maps, so just um, kind of bear with me, we'll, we'll walk through them all one by one. Um, but kind of the hypothetical vaccine that we're considering here is a vaccine that protects 90% um, against severe disease and does not protect you at all against infection. Um, and so the vertical axis is now varying the how well the vaccine um, blocks transmission. And, and just for reference, um, for vaccine efficacy against Delta, estimates have ranged widely, um, but in some of kind of my more current work, we're considering um, data has uh, shown that the transmission blocking um, efficacy is maybe around 35% um, for someone who has uh, two doses of an mRNA vaccine. So that's just to kind of orient you um, with, with what is realistic now. And so the top row here is looking at um, minimizing cumulative incidence. And so, um, and all of the columns are kind of these different uh, scenarios for what transmission looks like and, and the speed of rollout. Um, but we can see across the board for that top row um, that prioritizing adults 20 to 49 is, is the way to go in this case. Um, there is this area if you have the ability to um, roll out vaccines before transmission and, and are not as um, quite high that uh, kids is actually the best strategy. Um, but in general, kind of that, that 20 to 49 um, group is, is consistently um, the best way to, to minimize cumulative incidents. But if instead um, we're really kind of asking when does um, vaccination minimize either mortality or years of life lost? Um, so that is the second and third row here. Then we get kind of more nuanced results. Um, and so similar um, to kind of the results before, we see that um, there is an area where an indirect protection um, approach, so prioritizing those 20 to 49, is the way to go, but you need um, the, the transmission blocking efficacy to be very high in that case. Um, and also for ongoing transmission um, to be close to one. 
so, so well mitigated. Um, once again, when transmission is a bit higher, so we get that R0 is 1.5, then we see that um, prioritizing oldest adults is, is still a very robust option. Um, so in this area where we're, where we're thinking about this vaccine that does not protect against infection, um, kind of prioritizing oldest adults is going to be very important for, for minimizing mortality. Um, okay. And so just looking at the time here, I might um, kind of skip through some of these next slides um, and I'll, I'll talk about this, um, the results just briefly at the end. And so I know that was kind of a lot of heat maps um, to take in and, and a lot of parameters changing. So I just wanted to kind of summarize what our, our, our takeaways were um, from this work and our results are um, in line with, with a lot of kind of other groups that are presented today. Um, so that is kind of reassuring and, and it's important to see kind of how these different models, um, that these different models are, are converging on, on similar results. And so really, um, if the goal of, of vaccination is to minimize mortality, we see that in almost all kind of situations, um, directly protecting the most vulnerable is the way to go. And there were kind of three main areas um, where this was not necessarily the case. And so this is when there was a low reproductive number um, and the vaccine has really excellent transmission blocking um, efficacy. And you can either have the ability to roll out the vaccine quickly um, or prior to transmission. If, if you're in a country that is kind of in that regime, then an indirect protection approach um, may be more valuable, at least in the short term. Another result that we looked into um, that I didn't have a chance to, to show today um, was that if there are kind of dramatic declines in efficacy by age, then an indirect protection approach is, is once again kind of the way to go. On the other hand, if the goal of vaccination is to minimize cumulative incidence, um, and you have a vaccine that, that at least partially blocks infection or transmission, then prioritizing um, younger adults, so here age 20 to 49, um, is the best way to go about that. And then kind of those slides that I um, skipped over, because I, I think I'm a little short on time here, um, was thinking about this idea of, of how to extend um, your vaccine supply. And so if you have the ability, um, or if, if you're in an area where um, vaccines are limited, one kind of idea for how you might extend like the effective vaccine supply is by prioritizing those who are seronegative. So those who don't have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and some of the work that we have done has shown that, that this could have, um, this could be very beneficial, at least in the short term. Um, but there's also kind of logistically a lot of a lot of complications that would go along with an idea like that. Okay, so just wrapping up here um, and kind of thinking about how this model um, can frame how we're thinking about uh, prioritization going into um, 2022 is that looking at kind of initial reports um, of vaccine efficacy against Delta or Omicron. Um, and, and considering the amount of ongoing transmission in many areas, um, prioritizing 60 plus in, in places that haven't either begun to roll out the vaccine or have had a slower um, distribution is, is gonna be the best way to minimize mortality in almost all kind of situations. Um, and second, just re-emphasizing, I'm sure kind of this has been on, on a lot of people's minds here um, already, but Really, a lot of this work relies on our understanding of um, the duration of immunity and how effective the vaccine is in light of these new variants. And so getting better estimates um, for these values is gonna be really important to kind of understanding the dynamics and, and thinking about vaccine prioritization. And then the last point that I wanted to touch on is just um, emphasizing that we, we really need to evaluate and communicate the goal of vaccination when, um, when a vaccine has lower efficacy against infection and transmission. Um, so that is really kind of the, the area we're living in now, um, 
or at least here I'm in the US where the mRNA vaccines have been available. Um, and we have seen kind of lower estimates for vaccine efficacy against infection and transmission. And this doesn't mean the vaccines aren't working. They still do um, a really robust job of protecting against severe disease. Um, but this might signal that 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 goal of trying to kind of reach herd immunity through vaccination um, might not be possible. And that kind of minimizing cumulative incidents um, doesn't make as much sense when you have a vaccine that doesn't protect against infection. And so that's just kind of um, a nice point to end on and, and emphasizing that, that we really need kind of clear communication um, around this. And so with that, I would like to um, thank my, my team. Um, they were really wonderful to work with. We have a paper out on this subject um, and some of my more recent work has been looking at kind of the role of testing in areas where um, some people are vaccinated and some people are not, kind of what um, are other interventions going to look like and what impact can they have. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Kate. That was um, really great. And um, we have a question from Sam Brand.